Hello and welcome. I'm Sheila Averbuck, the social media manager for the Walter Scott Prize for Historical Fiction. Thank you so much to all of you who are joining us live for this latest in the second of the um, Walter Scott Prize shortlist spotlights. I am delighted to introduce Kate Grenville. She is the author of A Room Made of Leaves, which has just been shortlisted for the Walter Scott Prize. Kate, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. It's lovely to be with you all. I wonder for people who haven't yet read uh, A Room Made of Leaves or who aren't familiar with the MacArthur's, um, what is the book about and why does it center on Elizabeth MacArthur? Okay, Elizabeth MacArthur was the wife of the man who was known in my childhood as the father of the wool industry and was a great hero in, in the Australian culture of the 1950s and 60s. And his wife was this little known character uh, who was supposed to be this perfect, devout, devoted, supportive wife, you know, the classic 18th, late 18th century wife. Uh, well, I read some letters of hers and I thought, well, actually, there's another story here where she's not devout and devoted and compliant at all. She's somebody much more interesting than that. And as a way of exploring a general idea about how we believe dangerous myths in the past, I thought, right, I'm going to write a book that pretend, pretends to be her secret memoirs. So they'll kind of blow the whole thing open and explode the myth. When you read her letters, you felt sure that there was more more there and between the lines. And isn't there a famous lack of primary resources that show women speaking in their own voices, certainly in the 18th century? Oh, absolutely. I mean, most women couldn't read and write for a start, so it's a tiny number that left anything. When they did, those letters really had to be very bland and um, kind of a publicly readable because letters were public things. So the only documents we have by the real Elizabeth MacArthur are, a, it's a huge stash of letters, but they're mostly, I have to say, with apologies, fairly boring. She's writing to her children and so on. But just now and again, there's a phrase or two where the mask slips, the mask of this perfect, demure sort of uh, drawing room lady slips. And she comes out with something that made me keep, it's what kept me going for the 20 years of thinking about and writing this book. There is a story there. It's just buried very deeply between the lines of those letters. And it's not conceivable that her true thoughts could have been so boring. Can you give us a little flavor of, of what she went through from getting from Devon to uh, what was then the new penal colony at New South Wales? Yeah, she was born in a little tiny village in Devon called Bridge Rule, which I've been to, a lovely little spot. Um, and at the age of 20, she married, uh, in my reading of the situation, uh, it was a marriage of necessity, uh, a young soldier who went to uh, New South Wales uh, basically for opportunities for promotion. Now, uh, New South Wales, uh, meaning Australia, at that time was a new penal colony. It was a brutal, savage place on the edge of uh, the unknown. Uh, they had run out of food. There was incredible violence. They were being attacked by the Indigenous people. Um, in addition to that, the man that she'd had to marry was probably one of the most difficult, uh, aggressive, cunning, unpleasant, manipulative people that Australian history knows. And so that's she, in the record too, that, that her de his deeds are, are, are well known, aren't they? Absolutely. There's really no argument about that. He left a fab fabulous paper trail through which all his really unpleasant uh, behaviour can be well tracked. So there's no controversy about that, I don't think. So she had these two enormous things. I mean, for a woman who was who was brought up in something a bit like a Jane Austen parlour, really, uh, she was plunged into this brutal world for which nothing in her experience would have prepared her, and yet she managed to thrive. Now, that, as a novelist, the contradiction between those two things is what made me keep thinking, yes, keep going, there really is a story here and it's worth telling. And this is a woman of, of exceptional fortitude who isn't just writing pleasant drawing room letters back home saying, oh, yes, all is fine. I loved that one where um, her husband is away for a time. And in her letter back home, she said, you can imagine you can imagine my feelings on my husband come or my delight at my husband coming back, like sub zero level of delight, probably at him. Coming Absolutely. Back. Yeah. One of my great pleasures was to read through the letters turning them around in the way you turn around a Jane Austen sentence. She doesn't really mean that every man in possession of a fortune needs a wife. What she really means is, you know, a whole lot of other much more complicated stuff. So ones like that where she says, you can imagine my feelings on the return of Mr MacArthur. Well, yes, we can. Yeah. Absolute sort of horror. 
uh, that was a, there was a kind of sly delight in that for me as a as a as a writer. As um, they they settle in in New South Wales, but of course he doesn't stay there. He has to go back to England a couple times. Remind us why he has to go back to England. Okay, well the first time uh, he shot his commanding officer in a duel, shot him fortunately through the shoulder, and the man lived. But that's the kind of man he was. I mean, who 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 has a duel with their commanding officer? So he was sent back to face court martial. The second time he kind of upped the ante. He actually organised a coup against the governor. Uh, you know, the the representative of the king in, in New South Wales at the time actually dragged him out at gunpoint from Government House and arrested him. So, you know, the authorities caught up with him and, again, he was sent back to England to face a trial for his his uh, his part in that, in that coup. So he was away altogether for um, nine and four is uh, 13, nearly, nearly 14 years. And it was in those years that the sheep industry and his famous Merino sheep actually got bred to the point where they were, you know, recognised as fabulous. So it can't have been him that did it. And I think that's now fairly well recognised. It was not the father of the wool industry. It was the mother of the wool industry that, uh, that got us going. It's fascinating. It's the, these things that we accept as 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 gospel in in our own history. So many of them are ripe for re-examination because that towering fact, the simple math that you did there, makes it really clear that he it can't have been even if it may have been his idea, which it may not have been. He certainly didn't execute it, and uh, yes. the, you know, this, this young woman was was in charge of all of it. One another thing I found interesting reading the the book is that. Uh, Elizabeth it clearly loves her children. She, she writes very tenderly of them, but they're not hugely on the page in her diaries. You know, they did, it was that a choice she made and, and, and why? Why do we not get reams and reams about, you know, Edward and, and the others? Uh, look, in a novel, you always have to choose. I think I, think I put enough. There's a, there's a fairly, there's a, I think a very important scene where she gives birth to her first child, the, the reason they had to get married. And in those couple of pages, she does a she, she does that discovery that I think is probably familiar to a lot of women, that you go into a motherhood not knowing how you're going to cope with it, basically, how you're going to be. Do I have mother love inside me? You know, many women don't know that until the moment comes. So I've tried to show uh, in that extended scene, here is this woman who, who didn't want that child with that man She's in tears when she's in labour. She's miserable about the whole thing. And then the magic happens. You know, she looks at the baby. The baby does that little thing with its mouth, moves its little fist the way they do, and suddenly it all blossoms. I was pleased that you mentioned uh, about uh, sort of going behind the, the, the myths, if you like, of history. For most of the time that I was writing this book, it was actually my working title was Do Not Believe Too Quickly. And that really is one of the underlying themes of the book. Let's always look a little bit more closely at this history that we're given, these myths. After all, there is no one history. There is only a series of history histories. Exactly. I'd, I'd love to come back to that a bit later as well. For anybody watching this live, if you have questions for Kate, please do put them in the comments uh, and say hello to us. Tell us where you're watching from today. We are going to be... Um, uh, putting some of your questions to Kate later on. Just now, I wanted to ask Kate, would you like to do a reading from the book? Um, we'd love yes. to hear you, would you like to do that? Thank you. I'm going to read a piece. Um, it was a marriage of necessity. Uh, neither of these two people in my reading actually would have chosen to marry each other. So they've just actually been married. The, the, you know, the Reverend has said the words and here they are at the last moment. Mr. MacArthur's hands shook so much he had the greatest difficulty getting the ring on my finger. I could hear the breath coming hard through his nose, saw those trembling hands, and my own tremulousness left me. We were in this together, this stranger and I, as we had said in sickness and in health, for richer or for poorer, and his weakness gave me strength. He was that foreign creature, a man, who spoke the foreign language of power and assurance. But we came from the same country where a person had to appear to be someone other than who they were. 
The question that would shape our marriage was this. Would we be able to speak to each other in that secret language we shared? Would he trust me? Would I trust him? Enough to show each other willingly what I could see without him wishing me to see it in the trembling of his hands? So really the rest of the book is the answer to that question. How did that marriage work out? There is this, it, it's a lovely moment of hope at the beginning of their marriage and it, and it doesn't, it, it isn't shattered immediately. There's a, 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 on the night of their wedding when he said, doesn't he say to her, I don't, I can't, I don't have the words to explain how, you know, how I was feeling. And that plagues him. It seems to plague him for the rest of, of, of his life and certainly the rest of this story. He can't speak. So he, he acts out in, in outrageous ways. Something that really affected me reading this is I could not believe that they're on a six month journey across the world with his wife, his infant, and his wife is pregnant again. And he picks a fight with the captain of the vessel and they have to leave, they have to switch vessels in the middle of the journey. I, I just defied belief. It, it, it does, except that it is in the historical record. It is fact. He had a, he had a duel on the dock before they left Plymouth uh, and with the captain. Uh, and that captain was then replaced by another person with whom he also fell out. He fell out with his, his commanding officer on board. And yes, in the middle of the Atlantic, somewhere near the equator, Mrs. MacArthur, the baby, she's six months pregnant by then, the maid, all their baggage and Mr MacArthur are put into a boat. It's really hard to imagine none of these people could swim. The mind boggles. And this is this is the kind of man she had married. When they get to New South Wales, she has to have a, a short, sharp talk to herself when she looks around and sees this appalling place she's come to. And she has she says, okay, I'm going to survive this partly for the sake of my, my child and the future children I'll have. I have to learn how to manage this incredibly difficult husband of mine. And she does, basically. I loved the line you had at, at one stage. It's it's like he's, he's this... Um, uh, this incredibly difficult instrument she needs to learn to play. So when she wants something, she must not, ur you know, I must not urge him because if you urge him, he goes the other way. And it's, she, that that to me is one of her, one of her great achievements is how she can stay within this marriage because indeed she does, has many children and they're successful in Australia, but, uh, you know, and she doesn't, you know, throttle him. You know, she learns how to, to manage his wilderness as well as the wilderness around her. It's very impressive. She's very, very impressive. And we know so little of her. Absolutely. But of course, you also have to remember she had no choice as women did not have any choice. No way to make a living. They weren't allowed to own anything. If they left the marriage, they left their children. There was no choice. And I think that hardened her. She was a very, very clever woman and a woman, I think, of large heart. Uh, just reading her letters. And, you know, her husband was like a, a lot of men then and now, I think, um, armoured, uh, feeling that he had to be tough, uh, feeling he couldn't afford to show any weakness. I mean, that's a very male culture thing. But she saw enough moments of softness or weakness even, like in the trembling of his hands when he couldn't get the wedding ring on, that she he's not a monster in the book. And she also recognised that. But as you say, he was an extremely difficult instrument that she had to learn how to play. Uh, one thing that the, the judges love about this book, and they, they said in their summary of it, is that it's it's a it, not just beautifully written, but it it shows the journey of Elizabeth going from being uh, an Englishwoman to being Australian to becoming Australian. But of course, this is difficult as well because that itself is quite quite a modern question. She she talks about the fact that she knows she has displaced people whose home. It, they know it is their home, and I now live in this. And and she, this this isn't something that that she is blind to. Could you speak a bit about that? Yes. Look, a lot of my books are set in the past. You know, they're called historical fiction, but actually they're about the present. My real subject is today, and we in Australia are now at the point that Elizabeth MacArthur had arrived at, uh, in my reading of her, at the end of the book, where she looks around and she says this place is home, this is where I want to die. I want my my dust to become part of the dust of this place. Uh, there's no going back, I don't want to go back, my children are here. Um, but at the same time, she is wise enough to recognise that it's not her place. 
And she says, you know, I have to admit that I'm a thief. I have been a thief for every one of the days that I've been here in Australia. We have robbed the Indigenous people of what was theirs and we have moved in instead. And she says, acknowledging it doesn't undo any part of the damage and the sorrow of it, but it's the first step to working out what to do next, basically. Now, that, that I think, is exactly where, as a white Australian, that's where I feel I am at the moment, and my whole, you know, culture, my Australian culture is pretty much there um, with invitations from the incredibly generous Indigenous people to join them in working out how to share this place. After all, none of us can, can go back. I mean, my ancestor came as a convict in 1806 from Bermondsey. There is nowhere in Bermondsey that would have me. Uh, so this is our dilemma as a colonising culture. And so that's the sense in which this is a very contemporary book, although, you know, set in a, in a historic uh, dress, if you like. The, uh, it, it strikes me now when, when I visit websites of um, uh, uh, Australian local government or, or libraries or indeed looking in, in the beginning of your book, uh, official acknowledgement. I acknowledge the elders. I acknowledge uh, the, the people whose, whose home, whose land this originally is. That's it. It's it. These are not just words, but but they're they're they in a way they are just words. But these are words that there's been a real resistance to people saying. But they're the beginning of a healing process. It seems it's it's one it's one step of many steps, and it, it does, as you say, represent a huge. Um, let's see, how long ago was I at the Adelaide Festival? And like uh, like most people, I gave an acknowledgement of country, saying, you know, I acknowledge those elders, and I acknowledge that I'm on uh, the land of the. Um, uh, Ghana people, I think it is in Adelaide, and someone in the audience got up and said, "Oh, this is all just lip service. You know, you're just jumping on this trendy bandwagon, etc." That was maybe 15 years ago. These days, that would absolutely not happen. There has been a huge shift in the culture, and in fact, in most of these Zoom events, I acknowledge that I'm on the land of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, otherwise known as North Fitzroy in Melbourne, and I respectfully acknowledge their elders, past and present. And I acknowledge the fact that I'm on land that, you know, stories have been told on this land for since time immemorial. And I'm I'm privileged to be part of that. We have uh, come some uh, comments and questions in from people watching. Um, Ellie Krausen um, is a bookseller uh, in the UK and she says that she first fell in love with your writing when she was living in New South Wales in the early 2000s. She said, uh, Kate has hugely informed my social and literary conscience. Thank you, Kate, says Ali. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. That's, I think I've been very lucky because I, I, I came to adulthood at a time when Australia was changing radically and I'm, I'm still alive to see that, that potential starting to change. So thank you. Uh, we have an another comment from uh, Louise, who's also watching. She was wondering, are there any aspects of the book where you were particularly drawing comparisons with life and women's life in particular today? Is there, you know, can there be a parallel with 1788 Elizabeth and, you know, modern Kate? I'm awfully afraid to say there are many parallels. Um, that notion of uh, dodging around a, ma a man's moods would be familiar, I'm afraid, to many many women in difficult marriages. Uh, the sense of being trapped would be all too familiar to thousands of women. The lack of choice is not the lack of choice in who you choose to, you know, be partnered with, uh, may not be such an enormous problem in, in you know, the, the Western world, but there are thousands, millions of women in the world who still have no choice about that. Uh, and also no choice about having a stream of children, no matter how much they love them, uh, one after the other because of their husband's sexual appetite and his kind of refusal to, uh, you know, restrain that. So, yes, I think there are many, many parallels. And, again, I am interested in the present uh, rather than the past. And although women's lives have obviously come a huge way, um, the and the other the other big thing I think is self censorship. I mean, the Me Too movement has demonstrated two things. First of all, 
you know, how many of us have have been victims of that, but also how we haven't talked about it until quite recently. That phrase has released us, so now we can talk about it. Before, we didn't. So, again, that's a, that would be a parallel with Elizabeth MacArthur, who really had no one to share her troubles with. Yeah, I, you may know that the um, the Walter Scott Prize has a younger sibling, which is the young Walter Scott Prize. And, and we love to see so many young people aged uh, 11 to 19 who want to write about the past, who want to write about history. And they it, it seems to me they, they seem more more accepting of the truth of history than, than, than in, indeed we are, we over 50s. But if you had one piece of advice for young reader, young writers who want to write about the past, what would it be? Uh, it would be follow your passion rather than any sense of, um, you know, there's a market for this and so on and so forth. Um, you have to write from the heart. So what I would suggest is read a lot of fiction, a lot of uh, not fiction, history, uh, particularly the original documents if you can find them. There is some, some magic about hearing the actual voices of those people of the past, like in Elizabeth MacArthur's letters. And don't start writing until something leaps out at you, as a couple of phrases leapt out of MacArthur's letters, to, uh, and you think, ah, yes, that's it. That's something where I can bring my own experience to bear on that. Um, yeah, and then don't show it to anybody too quickly. Write a few drafts first. That's good advice. Uh, it, you, I think, also are aware that this is the 250th anniversary of Sir Walter Scott's death. Do you, uh, what, not death, birth. Do you have any connection to Scott? Did you read his work when you were younger? Look, I did. I did. And he was actually very formative. I have two older brothers, so I inherited their library of Sir Walter Scott, among other things, Ivanhoe and the Talisman. I still have the copies, actually. Um, they were really important to me because uh, the Australian history I was learning at school was eye-wateringly dull. It was, it was sheep and it was failed explorers and there was nothing else. And so it would have been very easy to kind of write off the past as just boring. So Walter Scott was one of the ones who said, no, 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 you can burrow into these bits of the past and you can find that actually there are real people there, complicated people making complicated, difficult life choices. And I think that inspired me kind of not to give up on the past and not to dismiss history as this kind of dull wasteland of facts and figures. Have you always written about history? Was that always your passion as, as, a, as a novelist? I never intended to, but... Um, all but one of my novels are set in the past, some of them in the fairly recent past, and I think there are two reasons why writing about the past has released something in me. First of all, um, if I were writing directly about all that stuff that I said about, you know, Australia changing in relation to the Indigenous people, uh, you'd find a lot of readers who would simply resist it on, you know, because of their own backgrounds. Writing something in a way coded as a historical story, but that has the same message, is a way of getting under the radar, reaching a reader who otherwise might not get past page three. So that, uh, that's one reason. The other reason, I think, is that um, that sense of discovering a story that is in plain sight and yet hasn't been told is very energising to the imagination. So, you know, I've known about Elizabeth MacArthur all my life. But only, only when I started to re write the book did I think, okay, um, this is something, it's not new particularly. I haven't had to invent it. She's been there all the time, but now I can see her. There is such a wealth of, uh, uh, there's such a wealth of primary resources now available online that, I, that we've noticed uh, looking, um, National Archive and so forth. So for writers who do want to look at original records, okay, we're still restrained from physically being able to travel to places, but this rich material, you know, documents, uh, letters, diaries, receipts, um, birth, deaths and marriages, certificates, it's all there. And so it's such a treasure trove, we just possibly don't examine it enough. But if there's one upside of the pandemic, I think it's been there so much more. We're now making use of digital tools much more than we were before. Yes, I think you're right. Uh, when I first started writing this book, I went into the State Library of New South Wales where the original letters are held, and I tediously photographed them all and then very, with huge difficulty, transcribed them from these faded, terrible old handwriting. I just about died doing it, but I did it. 
And uh, I'm now trying to put together a little collection of her letters, just a sample of the real letters of the real Elizabeth MacArthur to give her a chance to genuinely speak for herself. Um, and I discovered, of course, that there's an enormous transcript online. Now, I would not have... Uh, oh, <laughs> I know, I feel like a real idiot. Uh, but, you know, I'm not a particularly... I'm not a trained historian. So, um, But I think, again... If it had not been for the pandemic, I would have gone back into the library and struggled with the originals again. Uh, the pandemic has uh, made me try a bit harder online. Elizabeth uh, uh, lived out her life in, in Australia, is that right? Uh, well, she was 21 when she arrived. Yeah. And the rest of her life she spent yeah. here. She never went back even for a visit to England. And did, did, are there many, many MacArthur's now in, in Australia? One of our uh, viewers is saying that she has uh, an Australian friend named MacArthur and she now lives in Scotland and she's looking forward to buying this for her. There, there Are there many, many descendants of those original MacArthur's in, in Australia still? Well, John and Elizabeth actually only had, I guess they had, uh, they had a few grandchildren and one descendant still lives in the grand mansion that, that MacArthur built at the end of his life. Uh, so, yes, there probably are quite a few. I think it's, look, I actually don't know. I, I suspect it's not a huge family, um, but there certainly there would be some. It's a fairly common, it's a fairly common name, of course. The, um, the way that Elizabeth um, sees the land, which is, of course, your own writing about the land, you can feel her love for this country blossoming but contrast that for me to what she would have uh, experienced when she first arrived was it truly people living in tents um you know surrounded by some very dangerous felons uh big military presence is that that's quite a journey that she went on it's kind of unimaginable i mean she really did grow up in a she grew up in a parsonage in bridge rural so she really did grow up in a jane austen uh, environment. I mean, she was educated. That's why we have the letters, of course. The, the, the Reverend educated her and uh, and his own daughter. Uh, but when she got there, uh, the penal colony had been going for two years then, and they had run out of food because no supply ships had arrived, and the oh. ration was being cut week by week, to the point where nobody could do any work. They were actually too weak to work. Uh, the supply ship had actually um, been shipwrecked. So they and they they couldn't seem to make anything grow. You know, the soil around Sydney is not good, so they couldn't get any crops going. The animals had all died, the sheep, the cattle had escaped. So things were utterly dire. Even when they did have food, it was salt pork, which must have been pretty revolting after a year in the boats, and um, extremely old flour, you know, full of weevils and things, and peas, I think, was their only real vegetable, dried peas. Uh, so, you, you know, imagine that in contrast to her life in Bridge Royal where there would have been beautiful fresh food and all that. And then to be surrounded by, she was for a long time the only a sort of genteel woman in the colony uh, for about a year. She, she actually, there was only, the wife of the parson was the only other woman of education and kind of respectability. There were, of course, a couple of hundred women, but they were convicts, and so she couldn't have any kind of social relationship with them, you know, owing to the social thing at the time. Uh, she must have been desperately lonely. Um, it, it's very difficult. They couldn't even go for walks. If they went for a little walk, if they passed the absolute boundaries of this little tiny settlement, uh, they had to have a couple of soldiers with them in case either escaped convicts or, more likely, Indigenous people attacked them. So it would have been like uh, siege, a, a siege mentality. And because they had gone there, um, because there were no prospects for them at home, they knew they had to stay at least for a couple of years. I mean, there must have been mornings when she woke up and thought, ah, oh, what have I done with my life? You know, that night, that night behind the hedge that resulted in having to marry Mr MacArthur, what was I thinking? And, you know, she wouldn't be the only woman who had woken up and thought that. But she was an amazing, she was an amazing woman because she picked herself up and uh, dealt with that. I mean, the real woman obviously did, even though we have not much record of that. Uh, the fact is she made a fabulous go of it. She lived to be 85. She had a lot of children who obviously were devoted to her and she to them. So she's a she's a very positive role model for women, and we don't have enough foremothers. You know, men have plenty of forefathers, 
A lot of them are in on in bronze statues. We don't have enough of that. So I think uh, it's very important, I think, to rescue some of those women for their, from their silent obscurity. Well, it's an absolutely wonderful book for anybody who hasn't read it yet. Please do pick up A Room Made of Leaves by Kate Grenville. We are almost out of time, so we're going to have to say goodbye for today. Kate, we are so grateful that you joined us. Thank you so much for coming along and giving us part of your Sunday. For anyone who is watching who'd like to find out more about Kate's work, please go to kategrenville.com.au. That is Kate's website. And for anyone who wants to keep track of future live author interviews that we're doing, please subscribe to our YouTube channel or follow the hashtag Walter Scott Prize on social media. Next time we are speaking to Maggie O'Farrell, that's on the 23rd of April. That's at 8 p.m. UK time. Tune in if you would like to come along and ask your questions. So that is all from us for today. Kate, thank you again for joining us. And we are so grateful that you came along. Thank you to all of you who are watching and hope to see you next time. Bye-bye. Thank you, Sheila. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Bye. -bye.